Welcome, everybody. With me, I have Daryl Patterson. I think there's this divide in our industry. We often talk about the silos, and you know, we don't even get around to discussing the the component level manufacturers and that whole silo. And they they have this enormous amount of knowledge about you know everything from tooling, means and methods, etc., what they can and can't make. And you know, if we could bring that knowledge out of their silo into how we configure and think about buildings on day one then we can really change the economics of buildings. But really importantly, we can also change their environmental impact, right? The waste in our right. industry is enormous in every form of waste. And it's usually this lack of knowledge. We just don't know where the waste is happening and what drives it. And sometimes there's physical evidence of it because there's actually material waste at a construction site, but more often it's process waste and it's inventory waste and it's all those sort of lean wastes that... Are happening but are completely lost in a very siloed model. So I think BIM 2.0, if it's going to achieve anything, it really has to bridge those silos, institutionalize that kind of information and constraint awareness into the tools that are being built. Yeah, and so what I've noticed, and if we can discuss a bit, is there's been a series of mashups <laughs> between different domains that are adjacent. So I've noticed this intersection with the tools that came out in 2017, 2018, were like mashups of GIS and BIM to try and do urban scale planning so that you could have the context of the building as opposed to starting in Revit where you get a blank screen, you start drawing the building, but you don't have a context. You can't really run any sort of sustainability analysis around the impact of the building on its environment or the environment's impact on the building. And so harmonizing the urban environment with the proposed project was one of the first efforts of this sort of cloud-based mashup. And then as we get further into the more recent tools, we'll talk about the mashup that's further happened between generative design sustainability and then how that informs the project. But let's start just with the mashup between geographic information systems, GIS, and BIM, which is evident in many of the tools um, that we've given brief intros on here in the challenge. Yeah, I think if you look at those sort of historic tools like GIS and BIM and how a company like Lendlease was using them, and they were a big user of GIS because we have lots of projects. So they have lots of projects that scale in size from sort of 10 acres to hundreds of acres. So you say, well, I need a tool that can actually work at that kind of scale. And obviously GIS is starting to incorporate a lot of design functionality now. And right. then as you said, when you get down to the BIM tools, they're really more about just the design of a building. And of course, they can hold a lot of buildings and they can start to look at a scale that maybe seems like what we're seeing in GIS, but it's not doing the same thing. Now, you would say, oh, we must be using those two tools in some sort of combined way to understand a 20-acre urban development site. And in reality, we weren't and we still aren't, right? We, we use GIS for a number of things which are generally analytical. Right. As you say, examine the context, examine the context economically, environmentally, et cetera. It might be flows of movement of people and materials and things. And so we're not using it as a design function, really. It's not even being used by the designers at all. It's being used by marketers and other people with those sort of functions. And then BIM's trying to stretch into the space where we ask questions like, well, okay, we've developed a great building here. What's its impact on the cityscape? You know, where will you see this building from on the other side of London, for example? Or will I have a view corridor from this building to something up here? And how's it going to change the transport pattern of the city if I create this huge office tower in this particular location? And now we're finding that's stretching that tool out of its capability. And so that, I think, has led to this outpouring of these mashed up tools, as you described them, that are neither BIM nor GIS, but are saying, well, actually, people want to study buildings in context. The interesting thing is then how you systematize that and use the data to actually improve the process, make it more sustainable, and make the built outcome more sustainable. Now, one of the things I know that Landlease tried in this regard, I don't know how much you can talk about it, but there was a quality of places index or measurement or something that you developed that tried to use the output of that sort of urban design tool and the building designs themselves to score the type of development that Lendlease was making. And it was, I thought that was a very interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of myths and assumptions around real estate developers that their only interest is in what's the financial return on a project. But if you're doing large scale urban redevelopment like Lendlease on a global basis, 
you are very interested in the quality of place you're creating. Are you building a great place? Because you're going to be there for a long time. It's not a one and done building. And you need to have, we used to talk about social license, right? It's all very well to own the land and have the capital to develop it and have relationships with the various stakeholders that will help it happen. But there's this massive stakeholder group called the community and they're very complex and they're challenging and complex to interact with. And the better job you can do of creating a great place and doing that on a very objective basis, I think that's becoming increasingly critical to, to large-scale urban development. And so they did create a very comprehensive scoring system. In fact, you need a spider graph to understand where you're sitting on that. And they use it quite actively whenever they're looking at a whole site, but also any development within a site to say, what's this doing to this quality of place? The thing that I'll mention is that there's a whole bunch of tools, depending on who designed the mashup in their mind before they built the software, that think of automating and sometimes using AI to automate an office building or automate a hotel or automate some other building type. But really, in the context you're describing as creating a quality place that's sustainable, a lot of these, especially in urban environments, they're mixed uses. And, and a lot of this is just somebody putting a lot of finance at risk, understanding what is the social versus economic impact of the mix of uses and how much of each use I have. And are those, there are some of those things synergistic and additive? Are leaving some of them out going to really impact the quality of the place? These are very ephemeral problems to try and grapple with and just put data analytics to give you an answer. And so this is one of the reasons that I'm comforted that you're not just going to throw an AI at the problem and have it try and figure out patterns because there's a lot of intuition here from the standpoint of things that designers who have decades of experience have learned about creating good places. And one of the things that I look at in the sort of crop of tools that's coming up now in BIM 2.0 is are they really looking at buildings with mixed uses, because that's really, in my view, always the common situation that you have these mixed uses and that you're creating a place that has public access and intangible things that you use <clears throat> to discuss the project with the governmental authority that's granting you the entitlement to make a new place, right? Because you don't just have the authority to make a new place. You might have the legal right to build something, but but it won't be as good as if you actually craft the place that you're making. And I always like that philosophy that I saw from, from the approach that you had. Yeah, I, th I think when you really start to examine what is development of real estate at an urban scale, you go, wow, this is a massive multivariable problem. The variables, we had a stab one day, we sat down, we listed out more than 50 that were relevant considerations. Now, when you have a, a complex situation like that, of course, in engineering or computing terms, you would try and reduce that to a, a solvable equation. And in some senses, it isn't really a solvable equation. It's really like, well, I could solve how efficient the structure of the building is, and I could solve what its carbon footprint is, but I'm going to have to trade those two things off. And if I've got 50 of these variables that I'm going to trade off against each other, you know, what's interesting is some of them ultimately are just human subjective variables. And I say, that's going to feel like a better place. And that's going to feel like it's connected better to the existing city fabric. And that's going to feel more authentic. And you go, oh, I hate subjective human <laughs> things. That doesn't sit well with creating an algorithm. So <clears throat> having spent a lot of time in the property developer business, and especially looking at how architects participate in that, well, how would you speculate on these generative solutions changing the developer business and how owners look at projects? A couple of different ways. I think there's an obvious way which a lot of the current products are going after, which is to say, we traditionally don't explore a very wide solution space. You've got a blank piece of land, you're not sure on day one what you're going to put on it. So you start exploring options, right? And just because of the sheer amount of work involved in generating an option, doing the cost analysis on it, doing all the other technical analysis that you want to do, you don't generate that many options. You might start off with 14 or 15 very fundamental architectural concepts. You will quickly narrow that to a few, and then you'll take one and you'll progress that and you'll develop a design up. And you'll be doing analysis on that final chosen design over a very long period of time, months maybe even years before it's eventually executed. 
So it's a very serial process. Now, when we look at that, it, that has a number of things around it. One is it's taking a long time, so it's costing a lot of money. Two, when you find a problem in your analysis long a long way down the track, that's not a good thing. And so, for example, maybe you only analyzed the environmental impact of the design four months after you'd solved everything else, and there's no opportunity to go back and change anything to improve its environmental performance. You're locked in. But the other thing that I would challenge um, a lot of developers on is how do you know you've found the highest and best use? How do you know that was optimal? How do you know you're making the best profit for your business? And how do you know it's doing the best things it can do? And a lot of them would push back and say, oh, I know I'm an experienced developer. This is what works, right? And I've had those conversations with very senior development people. And it's like, yeah, okay, you're relying on heuristics, uh, intuition. That's cool if you've got all that experience. But we see a lot of development around the world that clearly lacked a lot of experience and, and didn't deliver a great place at all. And I think these generative tools can help us create a search across a very wide solution space and do that very quickly. So that's a long answer to one big change I see generative tools bringing. Um, the second change is the quality of the analytics and the timing of the analytics. And you've already sort of touched on that, that if I can complete a substantial amount of the design in days or even hours versus months, then I might make some fundamental decisions to change direction in those days, right? I might say, you know what, we, we've got a great sort of financial solution here, but we have a terrible environmental solution and we can actually decide to reweight what we're doing here. Or we might learn something. We might learn that the price of steel is skyrocketing and it's a good time to maybe change the design into timber or something like that. So I think analytical impact will be big, but ultimately there's some other things that are going to come from this that maybe aren't as exciting and sexy as generating a lot of different architectural forms. And one of those things is really important and that's certainty in project delivery and, and the risk profile that a project has. So if we use generative tools to rapidly iterate, find the best solution, but then also automate a lot in terms of the design production, right? And automate the way that the different designers interact with each other to resolve what has traditionally been a process of detecting and eliminating clash, but could now be done in a way where clash doesn't even happen because it's being coordinated in a generative sense. You know, what we're doing is we're really reducing the risk of a project. And I think at the moment, we're probably in the most uncertain economic times that many of us have seen in decades with this kind of inflation problem running around the world and supply chain problems that are still lingering from the pandemic, far from resolved. And so real estate projects are very much at the mercy of those kind of macroeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. Anything that is fundamentally changing the certainty of a project outcome for the better, I think is a very key tool for people who want to be in this business. So Daryl, one, one last thing. Thanks for all the time and thought that you've put into this discussion that we've had. Do you have a particular topic that, that you see as important in this, how these generative tools and BIM 2.0 impacts the build environment that you want to, that you want to touch on? Yeah, look, I think the thing I'm most interested in is how do we ultimately productize the, the building fabric itself? Like how do we get to buildings that are really made from advanced manufacturing technologies, whatever those technologies are? And so if we're going to have this idea of components that make buildings, you know, how do we bring that to life? And I think you need a real, a true ecosystem. You can't have an industry based on silos. You need to bring this, this knowledge from every stakeholder together through a technology platform. And componentry I find really exciting, not because I just want to move jobs off construction sites into factories. That's not the mission at all. The mission is to say buildings are, you know, they're sort of okay, but in some aspects they can be a bit shoddy. If they were manufactured products, they could be great, but they could be a lot of other things too. They could be far more sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. If you design a building for assembly, it's a small step to design it also for disassembly and reconfiguration and reuse. And I think we've all seen too much high quality building fabric put up and torn down and, and right. it's downcycled at best or, or not used and sent to landfill at worst. And I think there's a whole new opportunity in terms of the economics of buildings and their environmental footprint. If we can shift to more of a productized, industrialized way of making the components that those buildings are assembled from. But that will require 
exactly the technologies you're talking about. It, it does begin with that generative design and design systems that can inherit all of those means and methods. And that, that was sort of all the way back to our design make learnings. And unless you can capture all that and have a system, and unless you can automate that design process to, to bring in that huge amount of different variables, it's not going to work, right? Well, Daryl, thanks so much for sharing these insights with us. I'm sure everybody in the challenge has found this super valuable. We'll collect some of the comments. Potentially, we'll have some people asking things in the Q&A, and we'll send those to you if they come up. But thanks again for your time and your insights. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for allowing me to be part of it.